Hi, guys. Um, thanks for the intro. And uh, I got to say, it's been, I, I didn't really know what to expect when I came to Portland. Uh, I, I read a bit about it. I uh, thought that I'd like it. And then I got here, and I was like, actually, I really like it. <laughs> um, I went to Voodoo Donut. Uh, I had one of those because uh, I saw it on diners, drive-ins, and uh, dives, and uh, it was a you know cool, cool, cool thing to do. Um, one of the things I'm going to do before I uh, before I start this off is because we're an open source company, I I, I kind of document everything. So I'm going to go ahead and take a picture of the room because um, it uh, it's fun. There you go. Y'all look great. <laughs> Um, if you want to follow us, um, at GetPyTop is our Twitter handle. Uh, so you can uh, take pictures and tweet and all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm going to tell you about my experience with manufacturing and, and uh, how we went about doing it. It was, uh, I, I think, probably the main thing that I learned uh, from all of this is that uh, there isn't really like any mystique or any uh, any kind of right way to do manufacturing. There is just uh, more efficient ways to do manufacturing, um, and some of the new uh, techniques that that that, that we used um, basically made it possible for us to even make this product um, because. It can be an incredibly expensive process, uh, the, the, the manufacturing process. And, and, and the new sort of maker technologies uh, made it actually possible for us to think of an idea, um, make it in, in my living room, uh, and, uh, and, and then crowdfund it, and, and actually bring something into the world that we'd, we all kind of wanted. Um, so first thing I'm going to do is, is talk a little bit about the Raspberry Pi. and. Uh, and why we were inspired to use it as, uh, as something to, to make a laptop out of. Um, me and my co-founder, when we met, we both, I, I, I'm a full stack dev, and I liked using Raspberry Pi because it let me do uh, interesting things, things that I couldn't do with a MacBook. Um, you know, I could code robots with it. I could make light arrays with it. I could uh, pretty much do anything with it. And in the classroom, what it does is add this whole new layer of uh, a, 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 a sort of interest in the computing curriculum. So instead of just typing into a command terminal, well, you know, into a terminal on one end and seeing hello world pop out on the other end, um, you're actually interacting with, <clears throat> with robots, with light arrays, things that are in the classroom, things that you can touch. And that adds a, a completely new element to, to what you can do uh, in, in sort of in real life. Um, but when I wanted to take my Raspberry Pi to my co-founder's uh, flat, it was difficult because I had to, you know, there was, it, you had to set it up at his house. Um, and then, you know, you, you, you essentially, there was no mobility to it. Um, and there wasn't a lot of infrastructure to actually make it something that was just easy to take around and use. Um, and in the classroom, that actually poses a, a fairly big problem because teachers, you know, time is precious. And w what was happening was teachers would take 30 minutes at the start of the day to set it up. They would take all the HDMI monitors from like a shelf in the back of the classroom and they'd set it up, and then the kids would come in, and um, like silly things would happen. Like some of the pies would be broken because they would you know, they get stored in Tupperware, and static would would just break things. Um, and then on top of that, you know, you had to use a, a, an HDMI screen, and, and they're quite ins expensive in their own right. And a lot of schools they just don't have dedicated IT rooms, and so you know you have these really dedicated teachers that would spend basically an hour a day. Um, setting up and then taking it down. And so I thought uh, it would be a really cool idea to um, try and make a super affordable laptop out of it. Um, and the, 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 you know, the cool thing is you really can make anything uh, out of a Raspberry Pi. That's like a mini Mars rover um, that some people built. And, uh, and it, 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 
you don't have to, you know, you're not limited when you use something like that. Um, something I like to say is, uh, like the new MacBook, it's got one port. Um, well, the Pi Top has 74 ports. Um, you, can, you, you can connect it to, to, to anything. Um, and you can actually, if you're so inclined, it's got a, a modular PCB rail that you can either design circuit boards for and, and add functionality into the laptop. Um, so you, know, you can turn it into a weather station. You can turn it into to, um, yeah, pretty much anything. Um, now, we started, we had a goal, and that was to, like, let's just make something that's, that's fun. Like, let's make a laptop. Let's turn this thing into a laptop. Um, and so we did, and then that's the end of the story. And it was easy. Uh, not the case. Um, so what, what was the first step of, of our sort of manufacturing, our, our hardware journey? Um, <clears throat> and it was, uh, it was to quit our jobs. <laughs> Um, so, you know, that was like a really fun and heady time where we were like, we're going to make this uh, laptop and we're going to, like, <laughs> design this, this, this new thing that, that, that's not been made. Um, I should say the only thing that we don't make in the laptop uh, is the, is the we, so we don't make the screen. Um, we obviously don't make the Raspberry Pi and we don't make the keyboard, um, but we make everything else. So we designed everything else, the screen drivers, the smart battery hub, um, and uh, the, we, we even made our own HDMI cable because we weren't happy with having like a really long NAF looking HDMI cable. We wanted one that said PyTop on it. Um, so what that did was sort of thrust us into uh, the manufacturing world. Um, and so we started off in my living room and, and the only way we were able to do that is because of the essentially affordable maker tech that, can, that, that that's come out. Um, and this is kind of the first time that you can legitimately make something that looks vaguely commercially viable in your living room again since the 70s. Um, but first, you just need to make it work. <laughs> um, so that's what the first Pi Top prototypes looked like. Um, that one on, the, on this side over here is literally a piece of wood that we nailed prototype PCBs into. And we, we cut like a slice in the back of the wood so the screen would slot into it like nicely. Um, and then, uh, but that one wasn't mobile. That didn't have a battery. So then we decided, OK, let's, let's, let's properly make a, 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 functional, um, a functional laptop. <clears throat> and, and that's what you see on, on this side. And that's a cardboard laptop. Um, so that, that started our, our whole uh, journey. Um, and so first I'm going to talk to you about how we made, uh, how we made it to, to, to sort of Indiegogo, and then, um, and then how, how everything changed after that. Um, first, uh, I have to say that RS components and DesignSpark and DesignSpark Mechanical, um, if you're into making hardware, they're amazing. If you want to learn how to make hardware, I would definitely say at the outset um, that it's, it's a really good idea to use open source uh, software like this because you don't have to pay for it. And the great thing about DesignSpark is that it's completely um, unlimited. Um, so some, some, some free uh, software will limit you to having only 50 components on a board. And you'll quickly realize uh, when you get into to making things that 50 components isn't a whole lot. Um, and so it's, it's great to have uh, open source software that actually lets you uh, design pretty much unlimited. There are a few limitations. It's very difficult to make high frequency uh, sort of circuit boards that can support HDMI um, inputs and outputs. I don't actually even know how our first HDMI circuit board worked. It just did. And, uh, oh. Sure. Is that better? There we go. Um, yeah, I don't actually know sort of how, how the first HDMI one worked because you have to be very, very careful with, uh, with, with the lengths of the tracks and all that. Um, but that, that, that's pretty much the only limiting factor with, with that kind of open source, hard, uh, open source software. And that, it's things like this that, that are actually making it possible for um, like affordable uh, creation. 
So me and my friends, um, we'd saved $6,000 to, to make this laptop. Uh, and we thought that, that was like plenty of money. Um, it turns out it isn't. Uh, so we had to get pretty thrifty with it. And uh, so we built the desk that we built the 3D printer on uh, that we, we printed the first PyTop with. And um, the, like, the great thing about that is that the reason that we even got into to 3D printing was because when we were like, we made the cardboard laptop, and then we were like, well, it's time to put it in a cool shell. Um, how do we do that? Okay, well, we've, we, we've designed it and designed Spark Mechanical. Well, who do, we're going to 3D print it. Now, who do we get it 3D printed through? And then you, you go to Shapeways, and then Shapeways is like, all right, that'll be $700 a case. And um, when you only have $6,000, $700 a case is an incredible amount of money to be spending, uh, especially if you want to iterate. And that's something that I'm going to get onto is, is the sort of agile methodology, but for hardware. Um, 3D printing allows you to be super agile with your hardware. So you saw the first prototypes. Uh, then we started 3D printing the case for it. And that, that, that really allows you to make something that looks vaguely commercial. But the, the, you have to remember that your MVP, uh, so your minimum viable product, doesn't have to be beautiful. That, that laptop uh, actually has about 90% of the functionality of a, of a commercial pie top. Um, it's, it's really what you want, what you really want to do is, is make a proof of concept. Uh, and then once you've made your, your, your first prototype, um, the best thing for you to do is to get feedback on it. So take it out and, and literally give it to people and see what they do with it. Um, if you, there's a blue button above the trackpad there. And this is a really good point about uh, kind of like agile, uh, hardware making, um, I thought that looked really cool. I, was, I wanted it to look kind of like a cockpit, and, uh, and, and that blue button there was the, the on and off button for the laptop. Uh, and then I took it into a classroom, and the first thing the kids did it, with it was turn it off, um, because they thought that, that was the mouse button. Uh, and so it's, it's things like that that actually make a big difference. If you um, if you try and make something like perfect the first time, um, you're probably not going to make it perfect the first time. And you may end up doing something that you think is really cool, uh, but it might ruin the whole thing. So I would definitely say that if you're, if you're going to um, use 3D printing and you're going, to, you're going to try and make something, then you definitely want to just try and get as much feedback as possible. And the thing about 3D printing is that, so that case there um, cost us $20 to make in filament. So from $700 to get someone else to make it, uh, we, we bought a 3D printer, uh, and, and that one cost us $1,000. But then after that, it was about $20 to make every single case. And what that meant is that we could go out and test it with school kids. Um, we could test it with people my age, and we, we tested it with some, with, with some older people, too. Uh, and because of 3D printing, it meant that we could literally go out, see how people used it, and then we went back to my living room, and we just got on the computer, redesigned the case, and then printed out another one, and it only cost $20 each time. Um, that's like a huge, huge thing, and that, that's something that you can do right now. Um, I'm going to give you some tips. Uh, so along the way, we learned some we learned some things about making. Um, some of it anecdotal. Uh, for example, um, when, when you make a circuit board that has a lot of components, um, yeah, you can hand solder it uh, if you want. But that, that little circuit board there um, had about 150 components on it. And the first time we tried to solder it, uh, it took four and a half hours. And, uh, and, and luckily it worked, but we tried another one, spent another four and a half hours doing this thing, and then and, and it didn't work, and so you just waste a lot of time. Um, so what you can do if you're into making circuit boards, uh, you can actually just buy a toaster oven. Uh, buy a toaster oven, and when you, if, you get, uh, if you get a prototype board made, you can also ask for something called a, 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 solder, a solder stencil. And, and that's, uh, that, that's a little piece of metal that has the exact 
uh, stencil of where all of your, uh, where all of your components are going to be. And a, and a great tip is uh, get a piece of corrugated cardboard, put your, put your PCB on it, trace it out, uh, cut out the cardboard that you've traced, slap your PCB in there, and then tape your stencil to the top of it and flop the stencil over. Wipe your solder paste over the top, take the stencil off, and then place all your components on it. Now the great thing about a toaster oven is a lot of them only go up to 230 degrees, 30 degrees centigrade. Um, that just so happens to be the melting point for, for solder. Um, so for that, that, that oven cost us about $50. So for 50 bucks, we, we, we had a reflow oven, um, which is the fancy name for uh, uh, an oven that, uh, that, that melts, solder, uh, mel melts solder to components. We, we, we say solder, but somebody else said solder, and so I'm trying to, I'm trying to do the American thing here. Um, another thing is that living rooms are very versatile. Um, the only thing that you need for an Indiegogo video is a lot of Arctic white paper. And, um, and that, that, that's what you see. That was like 15 meters of Arctic white paper. It costs like $35. Uh, and so you can make a stage um, pretty easily. And what I'm trying to show here is that if, like, with a little bit of ingenuity, um, you can actually make something that looks pretty professional uh, when it's all said and done. Um, for, for not a lot of money. And that's, again, something that's pretty, pretty new. Like, even, even five years ago, this wouldn't really be possible. It's only possible because of uh, the affordable desktop-sized things that you're able to buy now. Um, and so that allows you to iterate a lot. Uh, over here is our first uh, PyTop prototype. And then this gray one is the second one that we made. Um, and it, it's a lot thinner. Uh, and, and, and at the time, it was, it was, it, it was beautiful to us, really. Uh, and, and, and this is what a PyTop case looks like uh, if you print it out in full. And if you go through the, 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 the process of making these things yourself, then you, you understand things on a sort of intricate level. And what you can see on, on this case here, um, we have these sort of rails that go up the top. And what we noticed was, uh, as we printed out tall objects, um, it's, it's quite difficult to print out large planar surfaces uh, on a 3D printer. Um, because as it gets to the top, it starts to get wobbly. So what we did was put little sort of bars at the top that didn't need to be there. But what it did do was make it structurally sound when it was going up. Once you've, once you've done all that, then, then it's time to uh, take some pictures of your proof of concept. Uh, and that's the point where you really want to try and make it look as good as possible. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, print all of the colors. Uh, why? Because it, it, it literally only costs 20, you know, $20 a case. And you can print all different colors with 3D printing. So this is something that you wouldn't really be able to do literally maybe even three or four years ago. There's, there's no possibility of having a wide range of colors. And that's actually pretty important because people associate um, like commercially finished products, they associate them with varying colors and, and all of this would be an incredibly expensive process if we didn't have uh, desktop 3D printing. Another massively important part of this whole equation is crowdfunding. So we made this thing in our living room. Um, we, we spent six months uh, making the prototypes, going around the country, um, figuring out how, you know, what people wanted, and, uh, and then we launched it on Indiegogo. Uh, we launched it October 13th, and I, I know the exact date because it was my birthday, and that's kind of like how in it I was. I didn't have a birthday, I had a product launch. Um, and, uh, and, and so if you team up this new technology, the new maker tech that's being uh, essentially abstracted from large industrial design. Um, if you team that up with crowdfunding, then you can make something affordably, put it out on the internet, and see if people want it. Um, it, it is a scary process because we were all in. Like, the credit cards were maxed out. There was no going back. Um, luckily, we were, we were funded in 48 hours, and. Uh, and a big part of that is um, we, we really wanted to try and network and partnership with as many people as possible and as many organizations as possible. 
And that's a really important part of the whole manufacturing process. I, I'd actually say that you know you, you can look at founders um, and, and think that they're like responsible for the whole thing, but um, in in a supply chain, when you when you market things uh, and, and manufacture things, there are like hundreds of people involved in it, um, and and so. It, you really have to think about manufacturing as a completely like collaborative process. Um, there are so many people involved, um, and it's important to try and uh, to try and work with other people, share your designs, and again get that like important feedback that lets you again iterate and make a better product. And part of part of that is always saying yes. So the only reason that we went from Originally, we, we planned to uh, make, make, make the case in England. We planned to injection mold the case in England and uh, make the PCBs in Eastern Europe. And that was because um, we thought the sort of language divide in China would be quite difficult for us to traverse. Um, but what happened was because we made, uh, we made the first prototype with RS components open source software, and we were so open about how we actually made the laptop, uh, they did a case study on us. And then they said, would you like to go to Munich, uh, to Electronica? And Electronica is like a really big um, electronics show. And I didn't want to go because we didn't have very much money. And I, I said we should just spend all the money on the product and, and not do any of this fancy stuff. Um, but it turns out tickets weren't that, uh, the, the flight tickets weren't that expensive. And my co-founder wanted to go. Uh, we went and then we met other um, like very large manufacturers, and we were lucky enough to meet um, uh, uh, the director of, of RepRap Pro, which is a great little open source 3D printer, and um, and they they're the ones that introduced us to uh, to to China to China and to manufacturing over there. Um, so this was sort of the start of our manufacturing journey um, and really learning about how things are made. Um, so we went to top left, that, that's a bunch of injection molds. In fact, that little corner over there probably represents maybe like half a million dollars worth of molds. Um, and, and that's what, uh, and there's an incredible amount of expertise over there. So we went around and we realized sort of what the actual processes are like. Um, and they're, it, it's really people orientated. It's very, uh, it's labor intensive, um, and, and it's slowly becoming more capital intensive. And I, I'm gonna talk about that a little later when I start talking about the future. Um, but all of this is sort of possible now. You really can make something in your living room and then end up in China one day, like wondering how you got there. So here's some uh, sort of bits and pieces of, uh, uh, of the actual process that you'll, you'll go under. So we, we design our own battery pack and that top right um, bit up there, it, that, that's what a, a sort of raw, raw, ba raw battery components look like. They're really long strips of, uh, 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 of metal and then they make them into a cell um, and, uh, and then you have your battery. You get into injection molding and um, you know, 3D printing actually sets you up quite well for injection molding. Um, if, you, if you're into 3D printing, then I, I really recommend just getting in touch with an injection molder because they'll give you tips on how to actually make the jump towards that kind of, uh, kind of production. And then to show you what kind of the reality of, of, uh, of hardware, this, this right here is uh, the smart battery pack that we had to make. You have to make about 50 to 100 of them to get certifications. Um, because you know it's one thing to make something, um, but it's another thing to make it safely. So you have to, you have to go through this whole iterative process um, to come out with something that's actually safe to go on airplanes, to go on uh, uh, you know, uh, over the seas, and to go into schools. And that, uh, that, that piece of plastic there is actually um, it's CNC'd out of a uh, out of a big piece of ABS, so that's that's like a a, a, a sort of um, a, 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 it can be quite a wasteful process, and I'll, I'm going to get onto that in a bit. But all of that then goes in, you know, you do that for for quite a while, and then you end up with with your final product. Um, 
it, it's a really long process. There's a lot of, uh, the, there is a lot of iteration. Um, and, but it's been shortened by the fact that you can actually use um, 3D printers. And I, I keep going back to these, but it is unbelievable that you can make something on your computer and press print on a machine next to you that's literally not like, it's like this big. Um, and then you have the, pro you know, 24 hours later, you have the product that you just designed on your computer. It's like mind blowing in, in, in how quickly you can actually iterate and how affordably you can iterate. So, you know, is there a, 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 a sort of hardware, a manufacturing uh, revolution happening on the desktops? Um, yeah, like in short, um, this is the first time that sort of regular people can really work hard at something and produce an actual product um, that's been iterated, you know, dozens of times for a fraction of the cost that it would normally uh, that, it, that, that it would normally take. Um, and so that's kind of the end of, uh, that's where we're at with PyTop now. We're shipping it uh, at the end of next month um, slash early July. Um, and now I'm going to move on to, uh, to kind of how, some, some practical points. Um, so how can you start? If you're in, if you want to start making things, I, I highly suggest going out and buying an affordable 3D printer. And by that, I don't mean uh, a MakerBot. Uh, or an Ultimaker or something like that because you're essentially just paying for the, the brand name. The, one of the best things to do, so RepRap, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a name for a whole bunch of different printers. Um, I really suggest going out and getting one of these. Um, they're about, I think they're about, like, they range, but at, at its cheapest you can get one for about like $750, a good quality one. Um, and the great thing about these is even if you don't know how to actually uh, make a 3D printed object, you can go onto sites like Thingiverse and you can, there, there's entire communities that make 3D printed objects that you can just print at home for free. So you're literally downloading uh, something off the internet and then printing it. And it's, um, it's really cool. So, you know, yeah, you, you can download a car and print it. Um, and then, well, What's it really good for? Like, what is? You're not going to make uh, a thousand pie tops uh, by 3D printing them. Um, but the great thing about it, the like truly revolutionary part of of what is desktop making, is that um, you can rapid prototype with them. Um, and what that means is that you can ensure you're not wasting money in your process. Um, so that's the. Th those are. Um, 3D printed versions of the, of the CNC battery that we sent off for, uh, for testing. And the reason we did that was because it, it, it's, you know, it's, it's more expensive to CNC things. Um, and so by 3D printing it first and making sure everything fits, you know that you're not wasting money at the end of the process. And so again, it just, it just helps you be really affordable with everything. And then if you are into, if you really want to delve in deep, um, you can start making circuit boards, and you'll see like the, those are yellow prototype circuit boards. They're single layer circuit boards, um, and, uh, and and if you want to get into it, then then that's definitely the thing that you want to make. You want to do that with off the shelf components that you can buy, so that you can make a proof of concept and actually see if the thing that you're thinking about works. Um, so now we're going to talk about the future. Um, but before we can talk about the future, we need to talk about uh, we need to talk about what is like the the main thing about manufacturing right now, and, and that is um, that CNC. So CNC milling it's a uh, it, it's the cornerstone of manufacturing. Anything in your pocket that you have right now, I pretty much guarantee at some point in its process something was CNC'd for it. Um, so you know, be it the pen that you're writing with. The injection mold for that was CNC'd. Um, your phone, so many components out of that. Like the case was definitely CNC'd. Um, but w w what, what's the problem with CNC? Um, it's, it, it, it's right there. It's an incredibly wasteful process. So the way CNCing works is essentially how Michelangelo would carve out uh, statues from marble. You get a big block and you chip away at it until you have the product that you want inside. 
Um, but there's a huge amount of waste that goes uh, along with this. It's like a crazy wasteful process. Um, some parts, some CNC parts, you'll actually waste 90% of the raw material by CNC. But it's the only way to do it uh, right now um, on a sort of mass scale. And that's, that, that, that's unbelievable to think about. It. Like, literally, 90% can be waste. And it's true waste. It's, it's literally shavings that go onto a factory floor. And if you're lucky, maybe the factory will put it into a water stream and filter it somewhere, and then they'll, they'll dispose of it correctly. But, um, you know, it, it's not always the case. Um, so, like, really think about that. 90% could be waste. And that's unbelievable. Um, but 3D printing on an on a, on a industrial scale, um, it, its fancy word is additive manufacturing, actually uses way more of the raw material for the actual product. So if you look at this, 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 this thing here, um, you'll see like all the holes in it. And that's, um, that's because it's been 3D printed. And when you 3D print something, you can use, there are some parts where you use actually 90% of the material and you only waste 10%. So these little support structures, you know, those are waste. But they, they're not filings and they're not being flushed out with water. So there's a, there, there, it, it, it's a whole knock-on effect. You don't have as much waste, um, but you still have the product that you wanted to make. And so, I mean, something like this really, really shows how much waste there is in, uh, in manufacturing. So if you look at this, it's like a conical shape, it's got tubes, and the thing about that is that each of those, you know, the thickness of that metal might be maybe two millimeters. But if you were to see and see that, that entire inside of that conical shape, it would have all been a block of something. Probably, that looks, that's titanium. It all would have been a block of titanium. It's incredibly expensive um, to, to just waste so much. But literally, you can 3D print it, and you use almost all of the raw material. Or you can see and see it, and you waste 90% of that material. And that's, th this is, this is the, the key, the key thing in, in the sort of future of manufacturing. It's wasting less and producing the same, if not more, consumer products. And so it's a way to essentially uh, be less irresponsible with the way that we make things. Um, so what's a real life example of where this is like revolutionized an industry? Well, the new Airbus A350, that's got a thousand 3D printed parts on it. And that, that you know, that's amazing. That's, that represents an unbelievable shift in the way that we actually manufacture. Um, but, but what's more is that 3D printing allows you to, to do something called part consolidation. And the problem with manufacturing right now is that, so this part up here, you can 3D print it in one piece. And you use like 90% of the material and only 10% of it is waste. But the really cool thing about things like this is that actually, that's, that, you, that used to be like three or four parts. And then if you think about those three or four parts, let's say you waste between you know, 60 and 90% when you make those four parts, and then you put the four parts together to make a single object. Now, if you just 3D printed that single object and you use 90% of the material that you start off with, the, 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 the actual cost savings and the waste savings, are, they, they become exponential. And so a, so a real life example of this is the buttons on the 3D printable version of, of PyTop. They're, uh, we kind of call them uh, inverse cantilever uh, hinge buttons. And uh, what that means is those buttons are part, of that in, that are, are part of that entire shape. So there's not more than one part there. Normally, there would be more than one part. And it just allows you to make things in a more economical and responsible way 
But what else is 3D printing doing? Like, what else is this additive manufacturing doing? Well, it supports hyperlocal manufacturing. So what are these guys doing here? They're 3D printing umbilical cord clamps. Um, and you, you, you don't get those everywhere in the world. Why? Because to make them somewhere else and fly them to, say, sub-Saharan Africa, it's not economically viable, right? But on this, and that's an Ultimaker, but on, on, on a desktop-sized machine, you can actually make something incredibly useful in the middle of nowhere. You don't have to have transport. You don't need to... <laughs> You don't need to make it in China and then ship it all the way there. It basically means that you can make products closer to the consumers that need it. And because you can do that, it means that it's affordable for the consumers at the point of purchase. So like, what's the big deal about hyper-local manufacturing? Well, it, it's logistics. Logistics is not a joke. Um, just to send out all the pie tops, uh, that, that have been ordered, I, we have to spend over $20,000 on shipping. Now, if there was, uh, if there was hyper-local manufacturing, if we could actually make cases that were sort of commercially viable by 3D printing, then we wouldn't have to CNC them, or rather injection, we wouldn't have to CNC a mold and injection mold them, and then ship them across the world. Um, and what's that add up to? Well, again, it's, it's less waste. And I keep going back to this, but it's, it's more than just the raw material that you're wasting when you make a product. So why do we have product packaging? Well, it's because you have to put it in a box so that you can send it somewhere, right? And when you put it in a box, you might as well make that box look really cool. Um, and you might as well make the inside of the box like a, a really awesome experience to open um, because you have to make the box anyway. Um, and the problem with that is that you have, you then have loads of cardboard, loads of plastic, and like things like those silica gel packets that go into the products, right, uh, to keep the moisture out. And so it's not just the raw materials that you're wasting when you're manufacturing things, it's all of the things that go around the packaging of the product. You know, literally, <laughs> you're making something that someone is going to rip apart and throw away in like 10 minutes. It's kind of ridiculous. But with hyperlocal manufacturing, you don't need the same type of packaging. You don't need that like open the box experience. Um, you're making it at the source. Someone goes to the shop, they ask for what they want, it gets made. They pick it up, and that's the end of the process. But it doesn't really stop there. So airplanes, they contribute 12% of carbon emissions. Um, and manufacturing and sending products across the world uh, is a big part of that. And with hyperlocal manufacturing, you cut out that logistics side of things. That's why. Um, you're starting to, well, in the UK, the post office is starting to 3D print things. Um, it's because large logistics chains are realizing that they're going to have to change and turn into essentially um, regional manufacturing depots in order to stay in business. They have to keep up with the time. And by going, to, going towards this like, regional manufacturing, um, we'll use transport less to ship things around the world which will lower the amount of carbon emissions that we actually, uh, that, you know, that, 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 that uh, upset penguins and whatnot. Um, it's, uh, it's actually a pretty big deal about like, how much carbon is, uh, is emitted in the manufacturing process. But what, what industries are set to be disrupted first? Um, you know, yes, you see like, fancy things like cars being 3D printed, um, houses can be 3D printed now. You can 3D print a house in like 24 hours now. Um, it, it's definitely not desktop sized, but um, it's pretty amazing. Actually, the, the first thing to be disrupted is going to be high value metals and industries that rely on high value metals. So things like jewelry, that, that, that's 3D printed jewelry. Um, 
And the cool thing about that is essentially you're going to be, again, using less raw materials to make the same thing. So we can have the same amount of uh, consumer goods in the world, but we'll be using less raw materials. It'll be made on the spot so you don't have to use the same type of packaging. The whole process becomes more economical and therefore sort of essentially the, the, the manufacturing process and the capitalist uh, sort of side of things, they're oddly the ones pushing for this. Why? Because it's less expensive for them in the long run to do this. Um, and high value metals right now are going to be the thing that's disrupted first because it's economical to do it. It's still much, much more cost effective to, uh, to actually CNC injection mold and, and, and make products like that right now. But eventually it will trickle down into, uh, into plastics and you'll be able to actually print more things on your desktop. You won't just be pr printing sort of, you know, polygon uh, Pokemons on your desk. You'll, you'll be making things out of metal. Um, and then I wanted to touch quickly on, on an, uh, another sort of big thing that's happening and, and, and will happen over the next sort of 10 to 15 years. And that's general purpose robotics. So you have this 3D printing process. And, and one thing that the 3D printing process or the additive manufacturing process does is it cuts out a lot of the, the, the chain of manufacturing. It's, it, you do one product uh, or, or you do one part that used to be five parts. You make it with one machine that used to be six machines. And you make it in many places rather than one place. And you don't have to ship it all over the world. But then you add in general purpose robotics. And general purpose robotics, the thing about manufacturing is when you go to Shenzhen in, uh, uh, or, or Eastern Europe and you, and you see how things are actually made, you'll notice that essentially a large amount of the workforce is, are, are doing things like this all day. They will grab something here, they'll put it here, they'll maybe put some tape on it, flip it around, a stamp will go down, and then they move it over here, and, and they do that thousands of times a day. And that's what they do. And that's labor-intensive manufacturing. But general purpose robotics shifts that into capital-intensive manufacturing. And what you see up there, I mean, I don't know why they put an iPad on its face. It's kind of, or, you know, some eyes. I guess it makes it look more human. But um, the, the, the point about this robot is that it can do different tasks. And yeah, they're low-skilled tasks, but they are different tasks. And that's like the first time that robotics has kind of gotten to this stage where we could potentially replace you know, what is low or semi-skilled labor with robotics. Um, I'm not really sure what the future is going to be like when that happens, because the, the impact of it is going to be so far-reaching. Um, and when we look at, essentially, when we have additive manufacturing, and then we add in workforce automation, over the next 10 to 20 years, there's going to be this like, seismic change in the way the world works, in the way that we make things, and, and the way that countries, uh, like big manufacturing countries, um, they're, they're gonna, they're, their entire economic structure is going to change. Um, and it's going to be sort of a weird and wonderful time to see what happens. Um, but let's talk about reality for a bit. Um, th this is what a typical... Uh, a typical factory looks like. It's got a conveyor belt going down the middle and then it has lots of people on either side doing things. Um, and, and realistically, we're not going to see this replaced um, for at least 10 or, or 15 years, um, simply because it's a, lot, it's a lot cheaper to do labor-intensive manufacturing. Um, and so how long will all of this take? It is going to take between 10 and 20 years. I mean, maybe there might be some uh, like freak team that ends up making uh, something that's ultra affordable and, uh, and just like pushes the progress of, of manufacturing ahead, uh, uh, you know, effectively light years. But in, in reality, it's going to take a while for, for these large, large uh, industrial manufacturing processes, this additive manufacturing to trickle down all the way to, um, to, 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 to these workplace environments. Um, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's the end of my, my talk. Uh, we've got some time for some questions, so um, I hope I've kind of opened up some, some thoughts on that. Um, anybody have any questions?
And now I, I don't have a pie top here. Oh, right. I don't have a pie top here today um, because we're uh, well. We have we have six in London, um, but I, I'm uh, right now. I'm uh, technically not supposed to take them on planes. Um, the prototypes. Uh, I have done a couple of times. Um, if you do want to get something on a plane that's not supposed to be on it, uh, I had I, 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 I had this issue when I was coming back from Germany with a Pi Top. Um, he said, "What is this?" And I said, "It's a laptop." And he said, "What do you do with it?" And I said, "My work." And he let me on the plane with it. <laughs> Um, but I, uh, I, I thought, coming to America, um, I'd, uh, I'd leave the pie top at home. Hey, man. Um, so I have a question. There's so many things that are fascinating, uh, fascinating to me about the pie top. But one thing in specific that I noticed um, that I was curious about was um, the, the decision that was made to put the trackpad on the right hand. And it seems very trivial, but to me, that's a very important um, aspect to the design, and I'm wondering if that was intentional or if that was related to the construct of, you know, the inside of the board or something, because I was thinking as we use, you know, g mice in general, right, that we typically have them on the side of our keyboards, whereas with laptops are generally at the bottom, and that's, so was that intentional? Was there a design reason behind that, or was it more of a hardware decision? Yeah, um, so one of, the, one of the unique things with um, Raspberry Pi is, uh, that it has these things, uh, GPIO pins, on the actual board. Um, and that's, so you see that sort of black line um, there at the top of the Raspberry Pi? Those are called general purpose input output pins. And what you do is you connect those to robotics or to light arrays or to any other sort of, uh, any other things. Um, and, and you can use the Raspberry Pi to control them. Um, so when we were making the laptop, we wanted to make sure that we stuck true to what Raspberry Pi is, and it's, it's, a, it's a maker's tool to, to, to connect with other devices. Um, and so at like 4 o'clock in the morning, uh, I, I, I literally like woke up and I was like, I'm going to put an acrylic slice on the top of this laptop uh, so that everybody can, can still have access to the inside. Um, and then if you look at the PCB rail there, that's, that's the add-on PCB rail. So the reason we put the trackpad to the right um, was because we wanted to make room for people to be able to actually get at the inside of the laptop, hack it themselves, and connect it to other things. And, and, and because of that, we couldn't do the traditional keyboard at the top, um, trackpad at the bottom uh, 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 kind of layout. If you do want a left-handed version, we are making a 3D printable left-handed version. <laughs> um, so yeah. Uh, you mentioned the pie top being used in schools. Where do you eventually hope to see it gain the most traction or really sort of find its, its place and even break out of what you originally intended? Um, so right now we're um, in about, uh, we're, we're doing a pilot, pilot schemes in, in just over 40 schools, um, but we've had over 100 teachers um, purchase the Pi Top individually so that they can use it in their classroom. Um, at first, what we're doing uh, with the Pi Top, so it, it's $299.99 for the full laptop. And, uh, and for that, you, know, you get the, it's got a 13.3 inch HD screen. It's got 12 hours of battery life. And the cool thing about it is it's completely modular. So if you want to use a different microcomputer, you can. If Raspberry Pi come out with a different microcomputer or a new one in the future, just take the old one out and put the new one in, and it'll still work. Um, so it, it, it represents like a really affordable way to um, have something that's like super functional. So um, w what I'd like to see it do is, uh, is 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 go into schools a lot more and um, and kind of add that like really engaging side of computing and and inspire younger kids um, to to actually carry on with STEM subjects and computing. Um, Specifically, uh, as, as we go forward, um, we, we we we've got we really want to um, break out into uh, developing nations. Um, we're we're gonna see what we can do about that, um, and uh, and we'll probably have some interesting announcements in 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 the future about what we're gonna do about that. But um, yeah, it's basically I'd really like to see uh, us um, make more affordable products, um, and I'm talking affordable for, for places like India. So India, they spend about 185 
uh, dollars per student per year on, um, on, on tech. Um, and so I'd really like to be able to uh, make something that, that fits into that, to, 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 to that kind of uh, price point. But with PyTop, I think um, the cool thing about it is uh, it, it just adds huge amounts of engagement to, to schools um, that, that, uh, that are in the sort of developing uh, nations right now. I just wanted to ask about uh, the timelines for your manufacturing process in the sense of you have uh, your development phase, your prototyping phase, and your uh, manufacturing phase, and sort of mm -hmm. how long did that, those, each of those phases take, and then some of the elements and moments in those phases that either sped your process up or stretched it out? Yeah. Um, so uh, me and my co-founder, originally um, what the PyTop was, was, it was a solar-powered laptop that was powered off of super uh, supercapacitors um, because they can be charged like five million times and they don't, they don't, the, they don't degrade. Um, and we wanted to make a, a fully enclosed case for developing nations, but um, we thought, kind of came to the conclusion that was maybe a bit ambitious to make in my living room. Um, the, uh, the, so it took us um, about six months uh, to, to, to develop from, from that to what we ended up launching with on Indiegogo and then um, it's taken us, from there, it's taken us about another uh, seven and a half months to, to actually make the, the commercial um, product. Uh, so ab about a year, um, it, just over a year, it's taken us to go through this, this um, whole process. Uh, that is because we were kind of learning along the way. Um, so some of the things that took us way longer than we thought, uh, batteries. I knew batteries were going to be difficult um, at the start, um, but the the real issue with batteries is the certification process. So you know, it ta you, you may make your battery, um, and then it takes six weeks for the certifications to actually, uh, you know, to actually get them. And if you don't get them, uh, then you know, it takes another six weeks to try. Um, so it's really important when you send in your batteries that you know they're going to pass. <laughs> um, but the uh, I, I would say in the future now, now that we know what we're doing. Um, I think it, uh, it, it depends on the complexity of the product, but I would say a sort of six month development timeline and then a two month um, sourcing and, uh, and assembly timeline is, is probably about as fast as you're gonna get it. So eight months is probably as quick as you can do it.